signed up and get registered if you're going to come to the ladies uh, prayer conference uh, we have a good meal planned Friday night for you uh, where it's being catered by uh, Captain Zinn down on Fort River and got a good breakfast plan so you man will be able to eat good amen and uh, but also uh, we've got good sessions uh, set up for Friday afternoon there's going to be a time where you can have uh, just be alone completely with God for one hour, amen. And so we want to be able to, to learn how to pray. We want to exercise what we learn, uh, and we want to see God move in a great way. So be sure to get registered for the ladies' prayer conference uh, Friday and Saturday. All right, First Corinthians chapter seven. Uh, I'm just going to read verse 1, and then we're going to go ahead and dive into it. It's a long chapter. I don't know if we'll get through it tonight. But he says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And uh, I remember years ago I was preaching, and uh, I, uh, I mentioned this verse, and I said, You know, that's why, you, that's why you are, you know, people should not be dancing. And all this, that, and the other, I said, because it's good for a man not to touch a woman. And, uh, boy, I had a couple of parents get upset with me <laughs> about that. Why do you mean it's not good to dance? I said, well, it's not good to dance. Or, you know, you're, you know, uh, doing things on the dance floor you shouldn't be doing as a single person. And uh, so, anyway, I don't know why I said that. Just thought about it. <laughs> I don't know. It was a trigger. I had to get over it, amen. <laughs> but anyway, he Paul's writing to answer questions that the Corinthians were asking, because it says here, now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. So they asked questions, and so he was uh, wanting to answer their questions, and he uses this chapter to address those issues. 
And uh, we must remember that Corinth was known for its immorality and lack of standards for the home. And they were struggling with a whole host of things. We already seen in the beginning chapters this matter of incest going on. And uh, now that he's going to have to address these issues with um, uh, male and female relationships, how to have a holy relationship, how to have a home that honors the Lord in this matter. And uh, so uh, he also is addressing these issues at the time that he's writing about this is during the time of great persecution of the Christian. And so the Christian was to be a testimony. They were to live their life in a holy manner. Uh, they were have proper relationships uh, between men and women. And so he's addressing that. Times change, but God's principles never change. And uh, one of the great uh, things uh, I think has been a struggle in my life dealing with trends and times changing is everybody thinks that the word of God should change to go along with the changes in our society. Uh, but listen, the time goes on and society changes and relationships get more and more corrupt, but God's word does not change. And what God states still works in a world that is changing against what God has so stated. And so the instruction of Paul in this chapter was given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that it must be applied in a practical way to each one of our lives. And, uh, and the Word of God is a living Word and it needs to be applied in a practical way, and re especially in reference to this matter of marital relationships. Number one, verses one through nine, we see Paul begins by addressing unmarried Christians and how they were to conduct themselves. In uh, verse 8 and 9, he just simply says this, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. So right off the bat, he starts in verse 1 through 9, dealing with uh, the addressee in your notes there is the unmarried and the widows. Uh, Paul, from what we can tell in the scriptures, uh, was unmarried at the time that he was writing this passage of scripture. Uh, very possibly, he was a widower. And the reason why we believe that he had been married because he was a member of the Sanhedrin. And um, according to Acts chapter 26 and verse 10, and uh, uh, tradition has it that in order to be a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, you had to be married in order to fill that place of responsibility. Most of the Sanhedrin was made up of priests, and uh, they were required to be married. And uh, uh, he was a Jew. Another reason uh, we believe that he was married, because he was a Jew raised with all the Jewish tradition. And in a Hebrew commentary on Genesis chapter 5 and verse 2, where it states that God made them male and female and, and uh, uh, brought them together, in, the, in this statement it is a Jew who has no wife is not a man. And so it would stand to reason, just knowing the Apostle Paul, his position of authority, going and imprisoning Christians, uh, executing those who believed in Christ, fulfilling the role of, uh, as a Pharisee of the Pharisees, uh, it would stand to reason that he was a married man at one point in his life. But now as he's writing this, he's writing it from the perspective of not being married. It's very evident he is not married at this time. So the common con conclusion of the matter would be that he was a widower. And that's why he addresses this matter right off the bat. He says, I'm saying to, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them uh, if they abide even as I. So Paul is identifying with that group of Christians uh, that were either just unmarried, they were single, or they were just, they were single because they were widowed. And so uh, we have to understand the addressees. Who's he talking to? Who is he addressing? In these first nine verses, he's dealing with the unmarried and widows. 
Notice the advice that he gives in uh, verse 1. The advice that he gives, he said, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And so right off the bat, he mentions here that it is an honorable position to be celibate. And, uh, and uh, uh, oftentimes you have this debate uh, whether it's more spiritual to be single than it is to be married and this, that, and the other. Paul is just starting right off the bat and establishing you that it is honorable uh, to be a person who is single, who is celibate. Uh, but also, he states that it's honorable to be married. That's why in verse 9 he says if they cannot contain, in other words, if they can't control themselves, let them get married for it's better to marry than to burn. And so uh, he doesn't place an emphasis more so on one than the other. Hebrews, we know in chapter 13 and verse 4, it says the marriage bed uh, is honorable and it's undefiled. And so uh, Paul places an equal emphasis on the role of the married and also the role of the single person. And uh, each one of us have a role to fulfill within the body of Christ. And so he's talking to unmarried Christians. Uh, so he gives advice right off the bat in verse 1. Then he deals with the action in verse 2 through 5. It says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the man, husband render unto his wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto her, the husband. The wife had not power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another. Uh, um, I'm sorry, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. And so the action, if you're a single person, uh, what is the action? If you're a married individual, what is the action that has to take place? Number one, he says this, we need to avoid sexual sin by marriage. So in other words, if uh, you, you cannot contain yourself, you cannot control yourself, in order to be able to be safe and avoid falling into fornication, which was prominent in the church at Corinth, he's saying you need to get married. And so then avoid sexual sin by marriage. But then uh, he says you need to avail yourself to God's blessings in a monogamous marriage, because he says, let the husband oh, uh, uh, have his own wife, and let the woman have her own husband. So it's a monogamous relationship uh, together. It's not multiple wives or multiple husbands, uh, nor is it uh, uh, getting married and divorced and married and divorced. Over an, it's a monogamous relationship. And uh, then... He says in verse 3 through 5, you're to add to your relationship through a mutual submission. And so the wife has not power of her own body, but her husband. Likewise, the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. And then he deals with this matter of defrauding not, uh, defraud ye not one another, except it be for consent for a time. And uh, in other words, you enjoy your relationship as a husband and wife because you're willing to submit one towards another to satisfy the needs of each individual. And uh, uh, what happens oftentimes is uh, I've, I've had people over the years come in for counseling and they say, We're got, we got to separate for a while. And I tell them, well, it's great. You can separate scripturally, but you're doing it for a time of prayer and fasting. And then you come back together because the devil knows how he can tempt you. And so they usually don't like that counsel. Um, but the world's mindset is the way I solve my conflicts and my problems in my marriage is I just need to kind of separate and get away. 
Uh, no, when you do that, you make yourself exposed and open to the attack of the devil. And so he says you're not to defraud or not to defame. You're not to withhold yourself from one another because God has so designed the blessing of uh, marriage is in reference to a sexual relationship. And so he says you're to add to that relationship by a mutual submission. It's not one lording over the other or one uh, holding up themselves to get what they want from the other. It is a matter of mutual acknowledgement that God has so designed us so as not to fall in sin to have a proper relationship together. And, uh, and if we're going to pray and we're going to fast, we want to meet with the Lord and we have a special time of prayer and fasting, then yes. Then you wholly give yourself to that so you can seek God, but afterwards you come back together. And so this matter of adding to the relationship with mutual submission. And then he addresses in verse 6 through 9 uh, the accommodation. Uh, the accommodation. Uh, notice in verse 6 he says, But I speak this by permission, not of commandment. And so Paul is just simply saying this he was being an example for them to follow. And, uh, and so he's, he's not really. The way he's stating this is he's not bringing a command that's overwhelming or burdensome upon them. Uh, he's bringing them an acknowledgement of their own frailties, their own temptations, and the attack and the power of Satan, and how he, even in the Garden of Eden, tempted Adam and Eve to disobey God. Now, how much stronger of an influence does he have on us? So you want to make sure you maintain a proper relationship so that you don't provide the accommodation for the devil to defraud you and defile you. And so Paul is just basically saying this. I, I want you to know I'm providing an example. Uh, I've been married. I'm a widow now. And a uh, widower now. And uh, uh, you have to have yourself under control at all times. So Paul was an example to follow. In verse 7, he declares that everyone has abilities that differ. Notice in verse 7, he says, For I would that all men were even as I myself. All right, Paul, so you're saying you would rather everybody sing it. He said, I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this matter and another after that. So he's just basically saying this, we all have different desires, we all have different abilities, and we don't live our life just based on trying to mimic or copy what someone else is doing because we may, may not be gifted in that area. And so uh, he wants them to be able to consider what is God's will. So that's number three there. Each one of us must live in accordance with God's will. What is it that God is willing in your life? Is he willing you to be single? Then enjoy that position as being a single person. What is God's will? Is he laid on your heart and impressed upon you uh, that you need a husband or you need a wife? That's fine. Then, then fulfill God's will in your life. And he says in verse 8, he says, I say therefore to the unmarried widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, in other words, if that's not their ability to do that, then they'll let them marry, for it's better for them to marry than to burn. In other words, it's better off for them not to, to marry and be satisfied than to stay single and be tempted with loss to the point where they commit fornication or adultery. And as they commit that fornication and adultery, they fall under that wrath in the hand of God. He said, it's better off for you to get married. And he said, but every person has their own abilities. Every person has their own uh, uh, way or gift from God to be able to live that out. So he starts out with dealing with his marital relationship by dealing with the widows and also the unmarried. Then in verse 10 through 24, he begins to deal with the Christians married to the unsaved. And this is always an issue and this is always a problem. Uh, that Christian being married to the unsaved. 
Uh, you may be uh, saved, but your spouse has not gotten saved yet. That creates and brings with it a lot of unique challenges in trying to live your Christian life and to be an example to them. So how do you deal with that? How do you have proper marital relationships as a Christian with an unsaved person? And Paul addressed that. First of all, letter A, you just got to be committed. There's got to be a commitment to the marriage vow. Irregardless of whether you're married to a Christian or you're married to an unsaved person, there needs to be a resolve that you as a Christian is going to be committed to the marriage vow. In uh, verse 10, he says, And uh, unto the married I command yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. And so there needs to be a commitment, a resolve, if you will, by the same person to honor those marriage vows. And so what does that mean? It says we are, as the Christian, we are not to depart. The Christian is not to leave the home. Uh, the Christian is not to give up on the marriage. Why? Because he says there in uh, verse 11, we are to be reconciled. We are to make things right. Uh, any marriage counseling I've done over the years, it's always been uh, difficult just to get the couple who is struggling in their relationship just to acknowledge they need to do what the Bible says. And that means you are to honor those marriage vows that you made. And in Ecclesiastes 5, it says, When thou vowest a vow, see to it that thou keepest it. And so we're the, the Christian is to honor those vows. And then uh, we have let her be there. We need the Christian needs to have compassion on the unsaved spouse. Verse twelve it says this: But to the rest be I not the Lord. If a, any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her. Let her not leave him. And so this matter of having compassion on the unsaved spouse, we're going to see in a few moments here that because of the saved person in that home, that home is sanctified. And, and the greatest compassion or love that you can have your spouse is to see it through in your commitment to your vows because you need to lead that spouse to the Lord. Not walk out on them. And uh, you need to, to give them the opportunity to know how Christ, who Christ is. So how would you do that? The Christian, first of all, must model the character of Christ. We, he must, you must model the character of Christ. We are supposed to be, that's why we're called Christians. We're supposed to be Christ-like. And so in our, in our marital relationship, we might be married to an unsaved person, uh, then we need to model that character of Christ, the love of God, the, 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 the mercy of God where Jesus could hang on a cross where they were crucifying him and cry out to his father, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Well, I couldn't forgive him. I couldn't, couldn't forgive her. Well, wait a minute. I thought we we're supposed to model the character of Christ. Well, preacher, you don't know my, my situation. It says... If the unsaved are pleased to stay with you, you as the Christian are not to leave. And so we must model the character of Christ so we have the opportunity to mentor their spouse to Christ. Your spouse, the greatest need that they have as an unsaved person is they need somebody to disciple them, to mentor them, to lead them, to guide them, to direct them towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And is it going to have, take place if the, if the saved leaves the home? And so we need commitment to our marriage vows. We need compassion on the unsaved spouse. And we need the consecration of the family. Notice in verse 14, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, 
and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. And then in verse 16, he says, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? So the role of the Christian in the home is to fulfill their vows and to and, uh, have compassion enough to show forth the character of Christ because you don't know whether or not you're going to be able to lead them to the Lord. I know, I know my mom prayed for my dad to be saved for 28 years. And uh, it, it, it wasn't always a real nice in the home. And my dad loved us and loved his kids. He loved my mom and all that. But the alcohol was a problem. And uh, my mom prayed for him for 28 years. She had people telling her, you need to leave that man. You need to divorce that man. And she would tell them, no, I'm a Christian. That's my husband. The Bible tells me I'm to stay with my husband. I'm to submit to my husband. And she stayed with my dad, and I'm glad she did. She prayed for 28 years, and my dad got saved. Amen. And as a result of it, I got saved. My brothers got saved. My sister got saved. We we're all involved in ministry in some capacity. And the amazing thing is this. That was all as a result of a woman who was saved determining that she was going to honor her marriage vows with her spouse who was unsaved. You would not believe, you probably would, how many people will argue that point with me. Don't argue it with me because you're on shaky ground and, may I say, walking across a earthquake hole. <laughs> and you start saying that the word of God doesn't work. Now, if you're, you're in danger, you need safety, whenever there's abuse, there's legal means that you can get to help you with that and handle that, but you don't divorce or walk out on your spouse. I know that does not fit into 2022. And I know that because it didn't fit in in 2000 either. So the spouse is set apart by the Christian that's in the home. The spouse, that's what it means to be sanctified. They're set apart. And because of the Christian is in the home, their children are not illegitimate. And literally what he's saying here, and uh, verse 14, elsewhere your children unclean, he, it literally means illegitimate. Uh, and it's in reference to a Jew that would marry a Gentile, their children would be considered illegitimate. And that's how strong Paul is addressing this issue. And I, I think we need to remind ourselves of how serious God is about this matter of marriage. Now, I know some of you have been married, you've been divorced, you're remarried, and not. The, the, the key is this. As you learn the word of God, from that point on, you start living according to it. You can't change your past, but you can live in the present. And you can look to a good future as you obey what the word of God says. Notice the conduct of the unsaved in verse 15. He addresses that. He's dealt with the conduct of the Christian. Now he's going to deal with the conduct of the unsaved. He said, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. Now, he just addressed the Christian has to stay. But he said, if the unbelieving do depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath given us to peace. And so, if the unsaved, if they depart, you just let them depart. You don't argue, you don't fight with them, you let them go. Uh, if they depart, it says here, that God has released them from the bondage of those wedding vows because God has called us to peace. So if they depart, the Christian is set free. And uh, here, here's a good illustration of this. Years ago, uh, there was a lady uh, that came to me and her husband was cheating on her. 
Uh, he had a girlfriend and uh, uh, they had beautiful family, husband and wife, beautiful property, uh, all this. And, and uh, she came to me and she said her husband had been cheating on her. What should she do? And I said, you need to stay there. She said, well, he's already moved to North Carolina and he moved to North Carolina and he's staying with his girlfriend down there. And I got property that we're joint heirs on and all this, that, and the other. And I don't know what he's going to do. And financially, I need to secure myself. So I need to divorce him so I can do all this, that, and the other. And I looked at it, I told her, I said, no, you can't. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says the Christian has to stay in the marriage. If the unsaved depart, let them depart. You're not under bondage in such cases. And I said, I'm going to tell you this. Which is this is what you need to do. You need to start praying for your husband. And you need to pray that God will convict him and bring him home. Or God will impress on his heart that he's going to divorce you. But you as a Christian cannot divorce him. And she said, well, you don't understand. I said, I, I do. I do understand exactly what you're saying. But I do understand what the Bible says. And I trust the word of God. I said, this is what you need to do. Well, that's what she did. And I think it was about two years later, he sent her a letter and told her, he said, you know, he wasn't coming back. He didn't want anything to do with her. He was divorcing her and signed all the papers, divide everything he made. And, uh, and, and the, as a result of that, she ended up dating another Christian fella a few years after that. And she ended up getting married, and what a great life she has with this new man that she married, a Christian man, loves the Lord, they're faithful in church. Uh, and she told me this, she told me this years ago, this was about four years, five years after all this transpired. She saw me and she told me, she said, Pastor, I want you to know, I am so thankful for the counsel that you gave me. It was hard. I didn't know how it was going to come out. She said, I'm so thankful for the counsel you gave me. She said, because I have no guilt about my failed marriage. I have no guilt about the divorce that happened. I have no guilt in reference to what my husband's doing and what he did to me or whatever. I have no guilt. I'm completely at peace and free because of what God did. I'm going to tell you, it's not easy to do what is right. But it is a blessing to do what's right and let God work out the details. But we're too quick. We want everything solved right now. And God may want to work through you in the process to bring that spouse to Christ. And so the best thing to do is just don't get in that situation to begin with. But if you find yourself in that situation, the conduct of the unsaved, if the unsaved says, I don't want anything to do with you, I'm leaving, let them depart. Then, then I counseled with her like this. I told her the reality is you can't be with another man and remarry until he's with another woman or he gets married. Uh, because according to Old Testament law, if you were committing adultery and fornication, you'd be stoned to death. And I said, so we don't stone people to death, but if he gets involved in a sexual relationship like that, you're released. You're not under the bondage because of the fact the Lord said, if they leave, let them depart, you're not under bondage of those things. That's hard to do, folks. But I'm going to tell you, God's word works when we obey it, irregardless of how difficult it is. So he deals with the conduct of the Christian. He deals with the conduct of the unsaved. Some of you are looking at me like a calf, new calf seeing a new gate. You know, I know you don't understand that, but they're scared to death looking at it. Don't worry. It'll be all right. Uh, notice the continuance in your role in verse 17. He says, but as God hath distributed to every man as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all the churches. And so the, this role, first of all, do not change who you are. And uh, he says in verse 18, 
Is any man called being circumcised? Let him uh, not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. And uh, so he's saying this. You don't change who you are. You are who you are. Let the Lord work in your heart. I heard this preacher. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's a shame what people hear. How crook these preachers are. This one preacher was saying... You have to realize this. You you don't you know God doesn't change you. God helps you to understand who you are and what you were have been all along. I'm like, yeah, he tells us we're a sinner. That's what the problem is. And God reveals to us that we're a sinner, and as his grace works in us, he changes us. But he said, Paul is just saying, listen, dealing with his marital relationship and everything else, you don't try to become something or change yourself to be able to appease the person whom you want to marry. So don't change yourself. Be who you are. Don't uh, do follow uh, God's commands. In verse 19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. And so... He's saying you need to just realize this, that as a Christian, uh, you have to deal with this matter of the unsaved around you, and they need to see that you're going to obey God's commands. And then in verse 20 through 24, do stand free in Christ. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou being, uh, called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. So this matter of standing free in Christ, uh, there was all kinds of situations where they would find themselves in bondage. And he's just simply saying this, you don't need to be in bondage in this matter of married or unmarried, single, widowed, whatever the situation is. Uh, you just need to obey God's commands and God's commands are, will always be fulfilled in your life. And whenever they are fulfilled, then you literally are free to be able to live your life for the glory of God. And so he deals with uh, the unmarried and widows. Then he deals with the Christians married to the unsaved. And then in verse 25 through 40, he deals with parents and of virgins. And so parent-child type of relationship. Uh, you need to keep in mind as you're going through the end of this chapter... Uh, that in the days that Paul's writings, parents arranged marriages for their children. I can see that working in America, amen. <laughs> but uh, 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 that, and that's what Paul's addressing this passage in reference to that mindset that the parents would arrange a marriage for their daughters. And so, first of all, he tells them this, letter A. You need to understand the difficulty of marriage during persecution. The difficulty of marriage. In verse 25, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath ordained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be, Art thou man, bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loose. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. And he says, But, and if they, thou marry, thou hast not sinned, and if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, it remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, well, and they that weep as though they weep not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and 
they that buy as though they possessed not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passes away. So, a couple of things here. First of all, he's dealing with this from the perspective, the difficulty of marriage during persecution. He's talking about the suffering here and the difficulties that they're having in society. And he's just saying this, whether you're single or whether you're married, it's good and it's right. And uh, as we started out, we were dealing with that, discerning the will of God. So whatever your situation is, don't look down on yourself as if you're not doing what's right or you're not fulfilling the will of God or you're not as uh, equally qualified or appropriately uh, uh, equipped to be able to do ministry in the church. He says it doesn't matter whether you're single or married. Uh, it is good and it's right. Trials should not prevent people from marrying or cause the married to divorce. That's what he's dealing with in verse 28. But, and if they marry, and thou hast not sinned, and if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such have, shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. And he's just saying this. Don't get married just because of the fact you feel because of the circumstances in life. I've got to do that right now. And a lot of people will, will make decisions, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, man, I'm, I'm almost 19 years old. I've got to get married. I'm an old lady. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, you know, when, when it's God's timing is working in your life, uh, God will bring it to pass and he'll bring you together. I remember there was a preacher down in Glassboro, New Jersey. This was years ago. This was back in the early 80s. He went down to Glassboro, New Jersey, and he was uh, pastoring a church. He started a church down there. He's a single guy. Single guy. He started a church. He was doing a great job uh, starting that church. And I was at a preacher's meeting uh, where he was at. I remember he said this. He said, yeah, I was praying the other day. I told God, you know, you led me to start this church. I ain't got time to look for a woman. So you need to bring me a wife. I need a wife. And he was praying. He said, I've been praying for a wife. And, he, and the next meeting was that. He said, the Lord gave me a wife. Amen. And he was all excited and everything. And preach. I don't even know where he's at. I lost track of him years ago. But though, uh, I just, I was tickled about that. Because, uh, you know, we get in this mindset that we've got to make the issue happen. We've got to force it to take place. We just need to commit it to God knowing whether we're single or whether we're married, it's all right, it's good. But wait a minute, I'm not going to do so. I'm not going to decide to get married just because of the circumstances in my life. You're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. Mm. Uh, notice in verse 29 and 30, regardless of the situation, the married can keep God first. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, and it remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. What is he saying there? I mean, he's, he's not saying to ignore your wife. He's talking about relationship with the Lord. Uh, you know, if you don't have a wife, uh, you're going to be spending time alone with God. You still need to have time alone with God as a husband and wife. And then in verse 30, it says, And they that weep as though they weep not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not. And regardless of the situation, the married need to keep God first. Amen. And if you don't keep God first in your marriage, you're going to have all kinds of trouble, all kinds of problems. And then number four in the notes there, you can see in verse 31, the single or married, we are in the world, but we're not of it. And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passes away. So we're in this world. We have to deal with the difficulties in this world. But the reality is that, that this world is passing away. And because it's passing away, then absolutely we cannot be tied to it because it's always changing. But God's word doesn't change. So we need to keep our relationship with the Lord where it needs to be. And so I'm, there's quite a few verses left. Uh, we're running out of time. We'll just finish it up next week in dealing with this. The key thought that I want you to take away from this lesson 
uh, is that uh, God has a plan and a purpose for you right now. Uh, whether you're married or whether you're single, you say, well, I'd like to become single, but I'd like to be married. Then you need to pray God will give you a woman. You need to pray God will give you a man. And God can bring that to pass. You need to also realize this. As Christians that are married, there needs to be a resolve that we're going to continue our walk with the Lord and we're going to build our relationship together because God has miraculously, uniquely created a man and a woman to socially interact with one another so as to satisfy the needs of each one of them in the marriage. And how does that take place? By submitting one towards another. That's how Paul starts in Ephesians 5, submitting yourselves one towards another. It's not about being the head honcho and the boss man and all this, that, and the other. And uh, I don't walk in the house and say, hey, baby, I'm the king of the castle. I'm sitting down, bring dinner in here. I'm not going to get it thrown at me, amen? But we're supposed to love one another and care for one another and nurture one another. You say, well, my spouse is not saved. I'll tell you, you need to love them up. You need to love them up. Because of the fact you need to show them the love of God and, and help them to understand that God can forgive them and change their life and cleanse them. And uh, God has put you in that situation so you can be that witness to lead that person to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a challenge. I know it's a challenge. But I know this. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so we just need to apply the word. Well, we need to pray tonight. Is there anything that we need to add to the prayer sheet? Now, of course, we'll be praying for the ladies' prayer conference coming up in a couple days. And for this Sunday, uh, that we'll have a great day in the house of the Lord. Anything else we need to add that's not on the list? Yes, you know. Uh, my friend's friend, uh, their family in Ukraine, uh, her name is Dina, I don't know, I-S-N-A, and their city is bombed. So let's pray uh, for these folks in Ukraine, uh, especially I N N A. I don't know how to pronounce that, but we'll be praying for them and their family. I was watching a clip this afternoon, and uh, bombs were hitting these buildings, and um, a mother, a couple of women, the mothers uh, had their children. They tried to get into a shelter. Uh, the bombs hit their kids. Their children were killed, and it just broke my heart. And uh, I, I don't understand uh, the political foolishness that's going on in America. Uh, we have resources and abilities to be able to help these poor people and uh, the foolishness that's going on. Yeah. I'm going to get off it or I'll start preaching. But it's a mess. We need to be praying for the Ukraine. Anything else? Yes, sir. I want to pray for uh, James not because um, my secretary's uh, other half uh, Diagnosed with throat cancer. All right. Process of surgery and going through all this kind of stuff. All right. So pray for James, has throat cancer, and have surgery and all that. So let's pray. God will heal him. Amen. Anything else? Don't miss anybody. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And we certainly have plenty to pray for. And so let's talk to the Lord about that. Amen. God bless you for being here tonight.